Good afternoon everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar today for accountants. Can a trust be included in divorce? By way of brief introduction, my name is Tara Tosh. I'm an accredited family law specialist and I've practiced exclusively in family law for over 15 years in Australia. I have recently been appointed a director at Michael Lynch Family Lawyers. Michael Lynch Family Lawyers was established approximately 20 years ago. In fact, we had our 20th birthday last year. And I'm looking forward to speaking to you this afternoon about can a trust be included in a divorce. Firstly, I'll just check that everyone can access the PowerPoint and to let you all know that there is a handout that can also be accessed by clicking on the icon on, um, on the page. So can a trust be included in a divorce? When I talk about divorce, in fact, I mean a property settlement and that's a property settlement either at the end of of a marriage breakdown um, or at the end of the breakdown of a de facto relationship. So many of you no doubt have been approached by um, a client who perhaps has separated from their spouse or who is thinking of separating from their spouse or maybe your client has a son or a daughter who may have a rocky relationship with their spouse and that client may come to you and ask, how do I protect my property? You may think that trusts are the answer, but think again. Whilst trusts are generally considered and used um, to protect property, beware the assets of a trust can be considered property under the Family Law Act and divided between former spouses. There are a number of things you will need to be made aware of when considering trusts within the family law space. It is a myth that the assets of a trust, um, of a discretionary trust, will be protected in the event that a trustee or a beneficiary separates from their spouse. So what I'm hoping to address for you today is to dispel some of those myths. And in overview, we'll be talking today about the following. First of all, I'll go through and look briefly at some of the fundamental elements of a discretionary trust. I won't take up too much of your time with that as no doubt um, you're well across those sorts of issues. Secondly, I'll give you an overview of how the court, and I'm talking here about the Federal Circuit Court and also the Family Court, who are the courts that administer the Family Law Act, how they determine an application for property settlement. They go through what you may have heard is a four-step process. Thirdly, we'll look at when a trust may be considered to be property. We'll go through some case studies, some cases that have actually already been determined by the court. We'll look at some of the powers of the family law courts. What are the family law court's powers when dealing with trusts? And finally, what, if anything, can be done to remove a trust from the court's reach? So discretionary trusts. Generally, discretionary trusts are used to minimise tax and or protect assets. Trusts usually involve, as many of you would be aware, a settler who establishes the trust. They usually jump out and don't take too much of an active role. A trustee who has legal ownership over the trust. The beneficiaries who have an equitable interest in the trust assets. And the appointor or guardian who is responsible for removing and appointing the trustee. Trustee has an absolute discretion to apply the income or the capital of the trust to the beneficiaries. Beneficiaries have a right to due consideration and proper administration of the trust. So keeping that in mind, let's now turn to how the court goes about dividing property upon the breakdown of a marriage or a de facto relationship. I should probably explain that whilst I talk about the court, um, of course court should be a last resort and I can tell you that 95% of family law matters settle before a final hearing. Most parties do reach an agreement um, and you may have heard that in reaching that agreement, they um, consider a four-step process. So following a decision called Stanford a few years ago, it is perhaps better described as a five-step process. Essentially, the court must initially consider whether it is just and equitable for there to be any alteration of the property interests of the parties at all. 
in a case called Chancellor and McCoy recently, the full court of the family court decided it actually wasn't just inequitable to divide property at the end of a 27 year same sex de facto relationship. In that case, it was because the parties had kept their finances very separate throughout, but that decision has attracted some controversy. In the majority of cases, it will be considered just inequitable to divide property at the end of a relationship or a marriage and the court then looks at the four step approach. So what's step one? Step one, the court identifies and values the property of the party um, and it's the assets, liabilities and financial resources of the parties. It doesn't matter whether the property is registered in one party's name, is jointly held with others, um, it's all of the assets and it's as at the date the parties either reach an agreement or as at the date of a final hearing, a trial. I emphasise that for you because it's usually preferable for parties to resolve property settlements sooner rather than later. That's because assets can change significantly in value between the date of separation and when the parties present at court or reach a final agreement. Um, assets such as um, real property can um, increase in value if there's a real estate boom, um, motor vehicles are depreciated appreciating assets as perhaps boats are, share prices can change significantly, that can affect superannuation and superannuation is considered um, property also. Um, we'll come back to step one of the um, four step processes, I want to deal with that in more detail when we're looking at trusts. So if we move on to step two then of this court's four step process, step two of the process is to look back over the marriage or de facto relationship and consider the contributions made by the spouse to the acquisition, maintenance and improvement of any property. This includes financial contributions such as breadwinner um, who paid deposits on a property um, at the beginning for example, non-financial contributions for example improvements to um, home um, that might have increased its value, homemaking contributions as well as parenting contributions and all of the contributions are, accept, uh, are assessed at the start of the relationship, during the relationship and again after separation. Again another reason to try to resolve property settlements sooner rather than later because it can be very difficult to untangle contributions made post separation, unravel what they mean. So if we move on then to step three. Step three is to identify and assess the future needs factors. Um, these are the future needs factors um, set out in either section 75.2 of the Family Law Act as it relates to de facto couples um, and section 90 SF3 of the Family Law Act as they relate to um, de factos. Um, so I think, I, did I say that correctly, married couples and then de factos, that's correct. So I've listed some of these on the next slide for you. Um, so some of the additional factors, the future needs factors that are taken into account are the age and health of the parties. Um, also taken into account is the resources and employment capacity of the parties. This includes the income, property and financial resources of each of the spouses and the physical and mental capacity of each of them for appropriate gainful employment. I've highlighted these in the slide for a reason we'll come back to that relevant future needs factor um, as we assess trusts. Um, also of relevance is obviously who has the care or control of a child of the relationship who may not have attained the age of 18 years, the necessary commitments and responsibilities to support others, appropriate standards of living. If a spouse is separated the court must consider what standard of living is reasonable for each in all of the circumstances. Contributions to the income and earning capacity made by either party to the income and earning capacity of the other, the length of the relationship and the effect of the relationship on earning capacity and also the financial circumstances of any future cohabitation as well as any other facts and circumstances that the justice of the case requires to be taken into account. So step four, step four is looking and assessing um, the contributions of the parties and looking at the future needs factors, what then um, is the order that will provide justice and equity to the parties in all of the circumstances. Um, so I suppose it's it's giving the court a wide discretion to make such order as is just and equitable. Um, I know it's very hard for accountants who work with numbers all day um, to 
be able to tell clients that when it comes to family law, there's no actual mathematical formula to apply. Solicitors can talk in terms of ranges. We talk about a party's entitlement maybe in the range of say 50 to 60% of the property pool, um, depending on how much weight a judge may place on different factors. Um, so. Um, letting you know that there is this wide discretionary power. Um, we can't actually say for certain that your client might get 62.2% of the property pool, but we can tell them a range based on other cases that may have been decided by other courts. Um, so that's a basic, I guess, snapshot of the four-step process. So what I wanted to move on to then is, I guess, what is property? When we're talking about step one, What's easy? Easy is valuing property such as real property. Um, we know that that's property. Motor vehicles, savings in bank accounts as property, furniture and contents as property and superannuation as I mentioned earlier is also property that's capable of being divided up between parties. You may have heard um, of a, a two lists approach that can be adopted in relation to um, the division of furniture. If parties don't want to spend money getting a registered valuer to to value the pots and pans, one party might prepare two lists of items and then the other party gets to choose one of the lists. So you're not going to put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, I came across this slide on the internet the other day and it's a photo of a divorcing couple splitting their beanie babies in court in 1999 and it does say 1999 was a simpler time and certainly beanie babies are simple, might be fidget spinners in the future that we're dividing in court. But what is hard when we're looking at property? What is hard is trusts. Um, so considering trusts, we're looking at um, is it a property? Is it property or is it a financial resource? Is it considered to be property at step one or is trust assets a relevant future needs factor to take into account at step three? Um, that is, consider it as a financial resource of a party but not property that's actually able to be carved up between the parties. So when looking at where trusts fit in, um, if they're considered to be property capable of being included um, and divided between the parties, what we're really looking at is the issue of control. So looking at that trust, is the trust the alter ego of a party? Does one party indirectly control the trust through a puppet trustee and or a pointer? Or is the trust a sham? So when we're trying to work out if a trust is going to be included in the property pool, importantly, your client will need to provide a full and frank disclosure of their interest in that discretionary trust. They will need to provide to you as their accountant or when negotiations for property settlement commence to the solicitor or the other party or the other party's solicitor or ultimately the court, um, documents such as the trust deed, any variations or amendments to the trust deed, the minutes of meeting of the trustees, um, financial statements for the trust and tax returns. Usually we ask for at least the last three financial years. If there's a corporate trustee or a corporate beneficiary, we need to look at the company constitution. And to let you know that the family law rules do provide that if a party is a potential beneficiary in a discretionary trust, they must disclose that interest to the court and to the other party or parties. You may be acting for a client who, for example, has an interest as a potential beneficiary in a discretionary trust, perhaps set up by their parents. Lawyers often will hear, sometimes from a spouse's accountant or a solicitor on the other side, that the party's family has refused to give them the documents in relation to the trust. So that's often tried on, but a beneficiary of a discretionary trust does have a right to inspect trust documents, including the trust deed and the financial statements. And in family law matters, a party must disclose documents that are relevant to the dispute. And a party's interest as a potential beneficiary of a trust is absolutely relevant. If a party doesn't disclose those relevant documents, they, or potentially you as their accountant, maybe on the receiving end of a subpoena, which is something you might be a little bit concerned about. So 
when we're looking at where trusts fit in and whether they'll be considered property of the parties, um, if there is a discretionary trust, the case law seems to suggest that the trust will be considered as property in the following circumstances. One, if one of the parties has the sole power to appoint or remove a trustee, Two, if the trustee, either a party or a company, is completely controlled by one of the parties. Three, a party or company controlled by a party is a beneficiary. And four, if one of the parties receives the majority of the benefits of the trust or can receive the majority of the benefits of the trust. Um, if a party has that ability to control the trusts, the assets will generally be considered the property of the parties and orders can be made by the court in relation to that trust property. I would emphasise though that in family law, each case is considered unique and the court will consider the individual facts and circumstances of each and every case and that matter will be determined on its own um, merits. So importantly when we're looking at the trust deed and the other documents very carefully, we do need to carefully consider um, who has that control, look at the provisions relating to any appointor, look at the types and the classes of the beneficiaries and look at the trustee's powers in relation to how distributions of income and capital are made. But also we need to look beyond the documents. Essentially, if a party is just a mere discretionary beneficiary, for example, they may be the discretionary beneficiary of their parents' trust, but there is no control, the court is more likely in those circumstances to consider that interest as a financial resource. So rather than view the trust itself as property at step one, it's considered a resource at step three under future needs factors. The court may then make an adjustment in the other party's favour having regard to the income, financial resources of the spouse who is the discretionary beneficiary. So it's helpful when we say look beyond the documents, look at the consistency of trust distributions that have made. If there's been some consistency then that will be a relevant factor, a relevant future needs factor that the court will take into account. Um, I can't emphasise enough how um, important it is to look at trust distributions when assessing what a party's entitlements might be. Say for example a husband um, receives an income from his employment of $100,000 but distributions from a trust that have been made consistently of say $50,000. If the wife's only earned $50,000 by including in as a relevant consideration the $50,000 trust distributions each year, then you might be able to convince the judge that the husband's capable of earning three times what the wife earns. So therefore, if you're acting for the wife, she might receive a greater adjustment for those relevant future needs factors at step three. So I wanted to um, give you a checklist, a bit of a takeaway for you when considering this idea of is it going to be property, is it going to be considered a financial resource, what do I look for once your client has provided all of the relevant documents that they're obliged to provide you um, under their obligations um, in family law. So have a good look at who is the trustee and what are their powers, who is the appointor, who are the beneficiaries, who has received distributions in the past, who is receiving distributions now, for example post separation, oftentimes there's a change after separation as to who um, is being distributed income. Have there been any restructures or amendments to the trust deed? I'm going to pick up on that very shortly when we look at a decision of Kennan and Spry which is a high court decision. Um, and we're going to look at then also um, when were any assets of the trust purchased, so before or during the relationship. This can be relevant again in working out control. 
So if we move on now to some case examples, I would say that um, some of the cases are a little opaque. You might think that there is little rhyme or reason to them, but I've just given you a snapshot of some cases here. Um, I can provide you with a full list of all of the relevant cases that deal with trust, if that would be of assistance after um, this seminar, I'm happy to do so. Um, but just to let you know, as a snapshot through the years, um, what the family court has decided um, in terms of, of working out trust versus um, at trust as property versus financial resource. So the first case, or one of the earliest cases that was decided, was the decision of Stacy and Stacy. Now this is in 1977. The Family Law Act only came into being in 1975. In that case, the trustees of the family trust were the husband and his accountant. The beneficiary was the wife. It was held in that case that there was no control over the trust, so it wasn't considered to be either property or even really a financial resource. The next case in the 1980s was Ashton and Ashton. The husband and his cousin in this case were directors of the corporate trustee. The appointor was the husband. The husband in this case had removed the trustee on two occasions, but the husband was not a beneficiary. In that case, the court held though that the husband had de facto ownership of the trust and therefore the interest in that trust was held to be property. So moving on to the 90s, we've got in Tui and Tui in 1991, there was a farming business that was owned by a trust. The trust in that case was established by the husband's parents and the appointor of the trust was the husband's father. The husband was a beneficiary. The trust property was not held to be the property of the husband. It lacked control. In Goodwood and Goodwin Alp, again in 1991, husband was one of three directors of the corporate trustee. The husband was the appointor and the beneficiary of the trust, and he had an unrestricted power to make alterations or to add or remove beneficiaries. So the trust was considered to be his alter ego, and therefore it was taken into account as being property. In Webster and Webster, the wife had control of some family companies. It's nice to see a wife in there. <laughs> and the trust after the death of her father. One trust was set up for the benefit of the children of the party's marriage. In that case, the wife undertook to distribute income and capital only to the children. Now, an undertaking to the court is basically a solemn promise to um, to do something and it has the same force and effect as an order of the course of the court so as the wife had undertaken that she would distribute only to the children the trust in that case was considered a financial resource of the wife but not property an adjustment was made to the husband because he didn't have access to the same sort of financial resource that the wife did so Millenkov and Millenkov were moving into the 2000s. So in 2002, um, this matter was determined and it, this involved a husband's father who controlled a trust worth $2.8 million. The husband and wife had assets worth $864,000. In this case, the trust was not property, nor was it really considered a financial resource. However, the wife did receive 90% of the property of the parties um, and an adjustment was made in favour of her as the husband was found to still be likely to receive some benefits from the trust, but not a significant financial resource. So the decision I mentioned to you earlier, Kennan and Spry, this is a high court decision um, and there aren't always a lot of high court decisions in family law matters, um, so all of us um, family law nerds became a bit excited about Kennan and Spry. Um, and I wanted to actually read to you the High Court of Australia statement that issued um, from the High Court on the 3rd of December 2008 because it does set out um, in some very clear detail what the facts of that case were and also what um, the judge's findings were, so the actual orders that were made. So in this case it says, the assets of a family trust established before marriage could be taken into account in property settlement orders under the Family Law Act the High Court of Australia held today. Dr Ian Spry, who was a retired Victorian barrister, married Helen Spry in 1978. They had four daughters who were now in their 20s. 
In 1968, Dr Spry created the ICF Spry Trust with himself and his siblings, their spouses and their children as beneficiaries. He was the sole trustee. In 1983, he himself as a beneficiary for land tax, tax reasons. <clears throat> in 1998, when his marriage was in difficulty, Dr Spry further varied the trust to exclude himself and his wife as capital beneficiaries. The Sprys separated in October 2001. In January 2002, Dr Spry divided the income and the trust between four trusts that he'd set up for his daughters. Mrs Spry went off and filed for divorce in what was the Federal Magistrates Court in December 2002. The divorce was finished in February 2003. In April 2002, Mrs Spry applied to the Family Court for orders for property settlement and maintenance. In 2005, Justice Strickland ordered that Dr Spry should pay Mrs Spry an amount determined by reference to the judge's assessment of the contributions to the couple's assets and the assets Mrs Spry already held. Justice Strickland found that the steps that were taken with respect to the ICF Spry in 1998 and 2002 were designed to keep property away from his wife and the family court. Under section 106B of the Family Law Act, and I'll come back to that shortly, um, he set aside the 1998 creation and the 2002 dispositions of assets. Dr Spry appealed. He and Edwin Kennan cross appealed in their capacity as the joint trustees of three daughters' trusts. So that's where Kennan comes in. He was the joint trustee of the daughters, three of the daughters' trusts. Dr. Spry and his other daughter, Elizabeth, cross appealed in their capacity as joint trustees of the Elizabeth Spry's trust. So Elizabeth's trust that was established after separation. The full court of the family court by majority dismissed the appeal and cross appeals. Dr. Spry and the joint trustees of the children's trust then appealed to the high court against both of those dismissals. So the High Court, by a four to one majority, dismissed the appeals and upheld the original trial judge's orders. The appellants were ordered to pay Mrs Spry's costs. Dr Spry and the children argued that the assets of the trust were not part of the asset pool to be considered in making property orders. And three justices held that without the 1998 variation and the 2002 dispositions, Mrs Spry would have had that right to due administration of the trust and to due consideration as a beneficiary. Dr Spry would have had a power to appoint to her the whole of the assets of the trust and the court held that these rights were property of the parties to the marriage. It held that the family court could make orders in property settlement proceedings as if changes to those property rights brought about by the divorce had not yet occurred. And the High Court held that it was open to the trial judge, Justice Strickland, to make the orders that he did. So that case is authority for the position that the assets of a family trust, even if that asset, um, that family trust was established before marriage, can still be taken into account in property settlement orders under the Family Law Act. So I'd like to talk to you about some of the decisions that have been made since Kennan and Spry. Um, and unfortunately, we would hope that there'd be a little bit more clarity around the issue of trusts as property or a financial resource, but we're still a little awash with uncertainty. And I'll explain to you why. We're dealing with a matter of Harris and Harris firstly, which was um, determined in 2011. Um, so in that case, I'll set out the facts for you. Um, basically, and you might want to write these down, otherwise it might get a little complicated, um, but the husband's father had established the Harris Family Trust. The husband's mother became the appointor of the trust following the husband's father's death. The major asset of that trust was a business that was run jointly by the husband and the wife. The business was valued and it was worth around $1.5 million. The trustee of the trust at the time the parties separated was a company. The directors and shareholders of that company were the husband's mother, the husband's son from a previous relationship and a good friend of the husband's. 
the beneficiaries of the trust were the husband's parents, the husband and his sister. Throughout the party's marriage, distributions were made to the husband's mother, the husband, the wife and a company. It wasn't the company owned by the husband and the wife, but a company that the husband actually admitted during the course of the proceedings was his alter ego. Surprise, surprise, the distributions um, to the wife stopped following the party's separation. Now, at the trial, which was heard by Justice Bell of the Family Court in the first instance, Justice Bell considered that the trust assets should be considered property and capable of being included in the matrimonial property pool. His Honour considered that effectively the husband was the trust. He took into account the distributions that had been made to the husband's alter ego company and also that the trust distributions to the wife had ceased after separation, which was evidence of control. But it doesn't stop there. The husband appealed the decision to the full court of the family court and the full court carefully considered the High Court's decision in Cannon and Spry and statements that were made by the Chief Justice of the High Court that for property of a discretionary trust to be considered the property of a beneficiary, there must be direct or indirect control by a beneficiary. The idea that the trust is a puppet. The full court of the family court did not consider that the husband directly controlled the trust as he was not the appointee or appointor, sorry, or the trustee of the trust. The wife in that case sought to argue that there was still indirect control and that the husband's mother as the appointor was a puppet of the husband. Now where I think the wife and her legal team really fell down and failed was that the wife did not actually produce any evidence to support her argument. She wasn't able to produce evidence that the mother of the husband was a puppet. So the finding couldn't be made. There couldn't be a finding of indirect control. Surprisingly, in that case, the wife didn't call or subpoena the husband's mother to give evidence at the trial. Um, you might have heard lawyers talk about you never want to um, ask a question of a witness that you don't know the answer to because you don't maybe want the answer to that question. Um, it's always a risk if you do subpoena a party or a person to give evidence. Um, if they're a hostile witness for you, you don't know what they're going to say in the witness box. But you need to bear in mind that courts can only make decisions based on the evidence that is before them. And so what the court in that case of Harris and Harris decided is that the trust was simply a financial resource of the husband, not property and then remitted the matter back for a rehearing. Um, so a, a lot of expense, I suppose, for the wife, given that she'd already been through a trial, she'd gone to um, the family court on an appeal and then the matter was going back again for rehearing. So I guess a takeaway from that case really is that if you're acting for the party who is alleging that there's indirect control of a trust by the other party or one of those puppet situations, really consider what evidence you need to produce to prove your case. Um, it would seem in Harris and Harris that simply considering or relying upon historical distributions um, was not enough to prove that the trust was actually property. So another decision since Kennan and Spry is the decision of Morton and Morton. Um, so that was a year after Harris and Harris in 2012 and the facts are these. Um, the players in this case are probably a little bit more complicated again in that the facts involved the joint appointors of the trust who were the husband and his brother. The husband and his brother were directors and equal shareholders of the corporate trustee. The trustee owned a, or sorry, the trust owned a significant liability which was an unpaid present entitlement to a corporate beneficiary. The corporate beneficiary had as its sole director and secretary the husband's brother and 
and the sole shareholder of the corporate beneficiary was the corporate trustee. So um, in this case, again, it was found that the discretionary trust was not the property of the husband because of the lack of control um, and there wasn't any evidence, I guess, of an indirect control or puppet situation, but it was considered a financial resource that was available to the wife um, and that was taken into account in step three of the four-step property settlement process. So seemingly there is a trend away from considering trusts as property and looking at them instead as financial resources. So as I mentioned earlier, in family law every case is to be judged on its own individual facts and circumstances um, and Again, um, I can only stress that <laughs> enough to you that it's really important to look at all of the documents um, and weigh and assess and work out what exactly it is um, that, that you're trying to achieve at court and making sure you've got all of your ducks in a row. So once we have looked at whether the trust is property or is it a financial resource, we now need to consider what powers does the court have in relation to the trust? What orders can it make and what powers um, does, it, does it have in relation to um, the parties involved? So, um, sorry, sorry, I've just skipped ahead, <laughs> um, racing ahead. Um, so as we heard in Kennan and Spry, the court can set aside transactions that would have the effect of defeating a party's property settlement. So in that case of Kennan and Spry, the court set aside that variation of the trust deed in 1998 that excluded the husband and wife as capital beneficiaries of the trust and it also set aside the husband's division of the income and capital of the trust to his four daughters after separation in 2002. Um, so it's under section 106B of the Family Law Act that the court has that power to set aside those transactions. Um, so if the court considers that the trust is property, it can um, make orders um, that, that will um, bind third parties also. Um, what I would say in regard to setting aside of transactions under section 106B of the Family Law Act, um, the court won't set aside a transaction if there is enough other property available for parties um, to give them their property settlement entitlements. For example, um, if there is sufficient other property, motor vehicles, um, cars, uh, I've already said motor vehicles, um, property such as real property, um, um, that might be owned, then they won't necessarily set aside um, the distribution of assets um, to take them out of the court's reach if um, a wife, for example, can get her entitlements elsewhere. Um, but I would um, stress to you also when you're dealing with your clients and talking to them um, about these sorts of orders that you know the court is a court of impression um, and if they're, they're looking at um, removing assets then um, then the court might scrutinise their actions quite, um, quite carefully there. Um, so in looking at the other um, properties or the other powers that a court has in property settlement matters um, is if the court does consider the trust is property, it can make orders that bind third parties. For example, the trustee of a trust to distribute the property in the trust um, and to that um, a distribution to the trust from the trust to the parties in a particular manner. So um, basically in appropriate cases, the court can disregard the terms of a trust deed and take money or assets out of a trust if it's necessary to provide justice and equity in a property settlement. So section 85A of the Family Law Act does provide the court with the power to deal with all property held for the use and benefit of the parties to a marriage. But I will say that courts do not make orders flippantly. It is more usual for a judge to make an order for a party to say, make a cash payment to their spouse and it would only then be in the event that that spouse perhaps can't make that cash payment that the court might order that the trust assets be sold or transferred to meet or comply with the order because the court does have to carefully consider the interests of any third parties and it will only make orders usually that are the most tax effective or the co most cost effective for the parties. So looking at the broad ranging um, powers of the court, 
How then can we potentially protect the assets of the trust? Can it be done and if so, what can be done? So a party to um, a matrimonial or de facto relation dispute may choose um, to relinquish control of the trust if they want to keep it out of the um, court's reach. But again, consider that section 106B of the Family Law Act and know that there is a possibility that even if they relinquish the control, there could be that setting aside of transactions. Um, it may be that during the relationship, the party relinquishes control. Um, but again, it's been my experience that where parties take actions or steps to remove beneficiaries or change trustees, if they seek to try to hide assets, then they create a bad impression with the judge. Um, and as the family law courts are courts of impression, and given that the Federal Circuit Court court, um, the judge that you um, have hearing your matter on the first day of court, perhaps because the other party has brought an application pursuant to section 106B, will be the same judge that hears your matter when you are perhaps giving evidence in the witness box at a final hearing. And they have a wide discretion. Um, so when you're going to court or you're advising your clients that you know they might be going to court, you want them to walk into court wearing the white hat and not the black one. Um, if you're thinking about preparing a trust for a client or you're looking at it establishing that trust because you're wanting to protect it from a spouse, um, then finding even the right appoint or can be tricky if you're looking at relinquishing control. What if your client's relationship with the appoint or breaks down, for example? Um, who are you wanting to actually nominate as the trustee? Um, does your client really want them having control over how the income and the capital for the trust is distributed to the beneficiaries? Think about the beneficiaries. Um, aren't trusts usually established to distribute income in a tax effective way to their beneficiaries? So, um, you know, unless you're going to make the beneficiary of the trust, say, a charitable organisation who has no connection with the family or with the business, um, then trying to relinquish control in the trust, it is incredibly risky. Um, and um, you, you might still have it no matter what, you know, taken into account in the pool because there is this discretion anyway. Um, and if it's to defeat a property settlement entitlement or it's a sham trust, um, then it might not achieve its purpose in any event. Um, so otherwise, the only other way really um, is to, um, to think about if the trust established, how do you make distributions during the relationship? Um, you know, advise your client to be very careful about how those distributions are made, whether it's made during the good times of the marriage or, or through the bad, because the history of those distributions is likely to be taken into account when you get to a final hearing. So otherwise, I suppose the only other way to protect a trust from being carved up is by dealing with it in a binding financial agreement. So you may have heard that a financial agreement or you may have heard about prenuptial agreements. Um, that's an agreement made before marriage, but parties can enter into an agreement either before marriage or before entering a de facto relationship. They can enter into um, an agreement during their relationship, after separation or even after divorce that deals with how any or all of the property might be dealt with on the breakdown of their relationship. Um, the agreement can set out what is to happen, who is to get what, um, and essentially um, agreements are used to try to opt out of that four-step approach that the court adopts in carving up the pool. Um, <clears throat> so as long as parties have each obtained independent legal advice regarding the effect of the agreement on a party's rights, which is basically to oust the jurisdiction of the court, um, and if they've received advice about the advantages and disadvantages to them of entering into the agreement, then the parties can opt out of the court process altogether if they have a binding financial agreement in place. So some of the benefits to parties of entering into a financial agreement that deals with what's to happen with the trust assets as well as any or all of their other property. Um, some of the benefits are finality um, and 
it's basically leaving the power in the party's hands as to what they do um, with their property um, and it gives them finality whereas at the moment you may have heard there are considerable delays in the family court and the federal circuit court in determining applications for property settlement. This might suit your client or it may not um, but um, there is basically, um, it, it's basically understood that they're taking approximately two years from the date of filing an application for property settlement to get to a final hearing, to get to a trial. Um, it's a practice of some Federal Circuit Court judges to overlist matters which means that a matter might be listed for a trial and if it's a property matter, if it's been overlisted with a parenting matter, the parenting matter is likely to have priority and then you're sent away again for another final hearing. And I know personally of a matter in the family court um, where it took some two years after the trial for the judgment to even deliver their decision. So there are incredible delays and that's why some parties are opting out of the court process and entering into a financial agreement where they have some control over whether the trust will be considered um, to be property or a financial resource and what's to happen with those assets. But again, a financial agreement requires the consent of the parties. Um, the benefits of a, an agreement also if um, one is, um, is reached between parties and they document their agreement in that way is that there are some stamp duty exemptions but beware and get some good advice. Um, there are some tricks and traps um, and there is CGT rollover relief and also superannuation can certainly be considered um, as a part of that property settlement and orders can be made um, about splitting superannuation. So those are some of the um, the benefits of reaching an agreement um, and I suppose um, the takeaway from today's um, presentation really is to look at those um, indicia of control and I'd urge you to to check carefully the documents when you receive them. Um, don't give them a cursory glance when looking at whether um, trust is going to be considered property or one of those financial resources at step three. Um, look at it and look beyond the documents. Look carefully about what has been the history, when have changes been made to the trust, um, when have distributions changed, um, what sort of restructuring has occurred um, and know that um, there are some minefields um, in dealing with this and, and don't tell your clients I suppose when they see you, um, oh yes because trusts can protect property, you're protected if there is a marriage breakdown or a de facto relationship um, because you may be um, on the receiving end of some disappointed clients I guess. So I appreciate that I've given you a lot to consider um, but hopefully I may have answered the question as to whether a trust can be included in a property settlement. Um, the answer is yes, the answer is will it always, um, maybe, um, otherwise it will be included anyway as a factor to consider in that four step property settlement process. So um, I've been asked to let you all know that um, following this presentation there is a feedback survey um, that should pop up um, when we finish and I've asked if you could um, fill that in for us please. Um, also if there are any questions that you have, if you might be able to put those in writing to us um, in an email, I'm very happy to, um, to address those for you. And also to let you know that if your clients would like any further advice about property settlements or um, entering into a financial agreement, the pros and the cons, um, and also just even if you know you, you have any queries yourself, um, you can always contact us. Um, we do offer a fixed fee consultation for clients um, and that's $330 inclusive of GST um, and we would be very pleased to be of assistance to you. Um, I know we've finished probably just under time um, but um, I hope that um, there is some useful um, parts of this presentation that you can take away with you and that you can adopt in your own practice. So thank you for your time this afternoon.